you got your dessert at the end of the day? What? You got your dessert? <coughs> what about Colin? Is he still eating there or what? He's not. Oh, he's not. He's <coughs> trying to pay the bill. Hmm? He's trying to pay the bill. Oh. God knows what that looks like. <coughs> <coughs> I'm not busy with it. Too much to Sarah? Yeah, that was busy too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's possible, yeah. What's that? Yeah, how busy it was. Today. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I left my coat in your office, so it would remind me that I have to go. Kitchen to get my dessert. Really? Okay. Are you jealous? Okay, everybody. I'd like to call the meeting to order and thank you very much for being here. We appreciate that. And um, with that, I'd like to start with the Aboriginal acknowledgement. And we would like to acknowledge the land of which we are gathered <coughs> is the traditional territory of the Tanaha, Silix, and Sinex peoples and is home to Métis and many diverse Aboriginal persons. We honour their connection to the land, rivers, and respect the importance of the environment to our strength as a community. There are no late items that I'm aware of, and I'd like a motion to adopt the agenda um, of... Yeah, we'll do it at the regular meeting, okay. Kevin. Yeah. Um, An adoption of the minutes of the previous meetings. Committee of the Whole, February 22nd, 2022. Moved by Councillor Woodward, second by Councillor Charwood. All in favor? Carried. Thanks very much. <coughs> and so now we want a formal adoption of the agenda. Moved by Councillor Page and Councillor Woodward, second. All in favor? Carried, thank you. And the next section of the meeting is public participation. And we have 15 minutes total for the presentation or presentations. And uh, Sarah Winton will keep track of the time. Prior to that, I'll just read out this short little bit of a preamble to help everybody understand the guidelines. Public participation period is for 15 minutes total. A speaker may only address council once for a maximum of three minutes unless authorized otherwise by a unanimous vote of council. Speakers must not address council regarding a matter of which a public hearing must be held or has been held prior to the council's consideration of a matter or adoption of the bylaw. Speakers must not address council regarding a permit for which public notice must be given or has been given prior to council's consideration of issuance of a permit. Speakers shall address all comments through the mayor, that's the chair here, uh, and that's the end. So if we have members of the public that wish to speak, you're welcome to come forward now and you have three minutes. Um, I would like to say I, I have five minutes. I don't know if you'd like a vote on that. Or five minutes. No, you have three minutes. Three minutes? Yeah. Okay, I'll talk as fast as Thank I can. Thank you. Yeah. And we could uh, just pass those around sure. as packages. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I'd just like to say uh, thank you for all uh, for everyone here to uh, doing the work of the city. I really, really appreciate it. Say your name and your location, where you live. I'm just getting into that. Thanks. Uh, my name's uh, Brian McLaughlin uh, from Nelson. I'm the uh, co-chair of Kootenai Freedom, and uh, I'm a retired nurse, now artist. We have uh, going on 2,000 members, which is a significant percentage of the voting population. We are a fringe minority. Uh, we gather in the hundreds and sometimes thousands or more outside your door every week or every other week. We represent the largest continued protest in gatherings in Nelson's history. We have lost our jobs. We are unable to go to restaurants, movie theaters, and unable to visit our loved ones in, in care homes. We even, in some cases, receive medical, are unable to see, receive medical treatment. Our overall participation in society has been severely limited. 
uh, for making a choice not to receive an experimental drug, a drug that has not been properly tested or that is only allowed because we are under the Emergency Act. Please note, uh, since th the latest government statistics on the BC CDC data shows 33% of hospitalizations are unvaccinated, 64% are vaccinated. This is recent this month. 26% of deaths are unvaccinated. 72% of deaths are vaccinated. The vaccine adverse re reporting system in the US has received more reports of deaths from one year of COVID vaccines than any other vaccine combined for the last 30 years. Please have a look at the link provided to you. I've emailed you this afternoon. The nine pages of side effects from the Pfizer vaccine just released under the Freedom of Information Act. Masks are lifted. Vaccine pa passports are due to be lifted April 8th. It's all over, right? Wrong. Many of us are still required to take this drug in order to be employed. We don't have our jobs back and it is now up to individual businesses to choose if they have to discriminate or not. Our health officials are saying, get ready to put on your mask and take your booster at any time. Our government has overstepped its authority and, trapped and trampled all over our charter rights and freedoms by implementing these mandates. I have not heard of one ticket, whether it has been issued for, for attending a gathering or for not wearing a mask that has not been thrown out. It is intimidation and not founded in constitutional law. Masks clearly have no effect other than to show how compliant we Canadians are. Masks are mandated all over the world by provincial and state health authorities. <coughs> Brian, Paul I'm sorry, your time's up. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Brian. I hope you get the idea. I, I look forward to discussing any of this with any of you. Thank, Thank you. <clears throat> Do we have any more speakers? Yes, Go ahead. Just introduce yourself and... Up you go. My name is Robin Flynn, and I am a mother and a woman. I live here in Nelson, and I honor the sovereignty that lives within me and each one of us. I acknowledge that I wrote a letter to this council. I haven't heard back. I've called every office of governance, and I've received the same answer. This topic of mandates, we don't have jurisdiction. It's a Ministry of Health. We just have to follow orders. And so I come tonight to remind each of us at a, that at a municipal, provincial, and federal level, including the Ministry of Health, none of these levels of governments has a, can grant any man or woman the right of bodily integrity the right to work or earn a living, the right to decide for our children or to be with our families or dying loved ones, the right to gather and worship, the right to travel in our land or enter and leave this country. Civil government exists to protect these pre-political and fundamental freedoms, not to bestow and remove them as if it can function in the place of divine intelligence or whatever name you call God. As elected leaders and public servants in this community, your role is to not just follow orders from the Ministry of Health. It is to advocate on behalf of all people, and I've not heard any of you advocating on behalf of the unvaccinated. If you have, I just haven't heard it, so I acknowledge that. Especially fringe minorities that have over and over been the focus of institutionalized harm we in the Kootenays have a long history of just following orders. In fact, the greatest harm ever inflicted has been with the justification of just following orders. This allows us to remove our heart, our deepest feelings of interconnectedness and our compassion the tr to the true extent and impact of our actions. Remember that it was just following orders which violently reforced the Sinaiks, the Tanaha, and Salix people onto reserves north and south of the border, 
It was just following orders to steal First Nation daughters and sons and for generation after generation from their homes and force them into <coughs> residential schools. It was just following orders to do the same to the children of the non-compliant fringe minority of the Dukabor Freedomites. The men and women who made their money off of working for these camps and these schools were just following orders. I get, we all gotta make a living. So there's a lot of examples just here in this land. And it's heartbreaking to see the harm of the mandates that is continuing and just following orders. And I would ask this council from my heart to please hold a special council to hear the true extent of harm these mandates have inflicted upon our community. Thank I would ask very, that you, you hold a council. Your, your time's up. Okay, you. and could, could I request, could I request a few more minutes to, to voice my request? You have taken up time from somebody else if you do that. So how and when can there be extra time to voice my request? You can write to a corporate officer. And I wrote a previous letter and there was no acknowledgement. How will there be an acknowledgement in the future? There'll be an acknowledgement, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Are there any further speakers? Can we just provide clarity on where to send a letter? I'll do that at the end. Okay, sorry. At the end. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, so I'm going to finish reading the letter that uh, Brian started reading here. Um, State your name. Oh, Kevin Shaw. Okay. Uh, masks that clearly have no effect other than to show how compliant we Canadians are. Masks are mandated all over the world by <coughs> provincial and state health authorities. Policies created by the largest entities on earth, big pharmaceutical companies. They have no democratic input or meaningful scientific debate. The size of, the, of a virus is many times smaller than the mesh size of any mask. Masks do more harm than good, both mentally and physically. Central to understanding this pandemic is understanding the misuse of the COVID PCR test, PCR test, sorry, which has created a pandemic of cases. The polymerase chain reaction test invented by Kerry Mullis was never intended to be a tool for diagnosing illness. It amplifies genetic material, but cannot tell you where that genetic material came from, um, or whether that genetic material is the cause of any illness. The PCR test can have a false positive rate upwards of 90%. Why has our Nelson Star, which had previously ne never previously been reliant on government funding, now receiving 140 grand per year from our Trudeau government? Why are they only reporting on cases, 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 and not symptoms, and not accepting any of our editorials or ads? Press is now censoring our voice. Druthers, publicly owned and funded, newspaper with a circulation in the hundreds of thousands, is a voice of reason. This crisis has and is creating a financial meltdown. Since the start of the pandemic, we have printed 40 to 60% of the money in circulation today creating a hyperinflationary event that we are just beginning to see now. Fear is a great tool for taking away people's rights, and these rights are rarely given back without fighting for them. What do we want? We want to engage in a respectful discussion that does not resort to name-calling or utilize censorship. We want you to educate yourselves on not just the corporate narrative, but reach out and see what's happening in your community. Visit the hospital, see how many are in there, Death rates have not gone up in any significant way, and this is the worst pandemic in world history. We want the City Police Board to rescind their decision to override the Nelson City Police's decision to not mandate this experimental vaccine. We want our community police force back. Understand that these mandates are hurting way more people than they are helping. There is a lot more than a virus at issue here. We believe that the Charter of Rights and Freedoms is a fundamental is fundamental to respecting the rule of law that protects minorities, our constitution, and our human rights are the final law of the land. Come to our speaker tomorrow, Chris Sky is speaking about our freedoms at noon outside of City Hall. Uh, there's also a doctor's tour, originally scheduled to come next week, but it's been postponed now till April. That will be at Lakeside Park. Um, we'd like you to attend that. There'll be uh, three local BC doctors. Your time's up, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much.
Um, thank you for your okay, presentation. You. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
And this led bear activity to kind of spike. Locally, it was more like the drought and the smoke led to low berry crop. So when the fall came around, the numbers spiked. Cougar activity is actually low, which you wouldn't have known because there was a couple very high profile incidents specifically at Poplar Rock. Grizzly bear was slightly higher and there was a couple incidences up near Kokanee Creek Park that were worrisome. So overall, it was generally a higher wildlife activity year um, for conflict. Garbage, once again, was our biggest attractant, and that's always more in the more urban areas, but fruit trees is always a problem in Nelson, and this year compost was a huge issue, especially around Rosemont. There was a couple bears in Rosemont that were just loved compost, so and we don't usually recommend even let people necessarily have to put away their compost. We try and get them to... Um, you know, alter the materials or really look after them. But this year, we actually did recommend people just put it away because the bears had really learned where there was compost, there was food. So outdoor freezers were quite big this year and bird feeders. We had a lot of bears going onto patios for bird feeders. In response to this activity, we did the normal things that we usually do every year, the door-to-door -door education, garbage tagging, events and display booths, radio print and online media. We had a real push in the Wild Safe Rangers youth programming. Um, and we didn't get to too many new programs, but I will touch on them. And of course, all of this was done through COVID-19 mitigation. So the activities this year were done smaller groups, social distancing, video conferencing, and were altered as the guidelines were changed. There was no contact door to door, but if we saw people outside, we definitely would talk to them. So yeah, safety protocols included our distancing, contact tracing, masks, and sanitation. So events and display booths, we were back at the farmer's markets this year, so that was wonderful. But more than even the farmer's markets, I really did a push for trailhead and park booths. There was lots, lots of wildlife conflict on some of the North Shore trails this year, so I would just sit up there and I would do bear spray training on demand, talk to people as they went up, just educating people like Pulpit Rock in particular where there was that cougar um, incident. Most people are going up there without any bear spray and just have a very casual attitude when there's constantly bears on that trail. And while those bears are somewhat habituated and used to people, there have been instances, particularly with mothers and cubs and dogs, of aggression. And as we found out this year, there also was, a, you know, cougar activity, which is fairly regular up there. They just don't generally want to be around us. I did presentations at local businesses. And we did all through the through our farmer's markets and the park, particularly the trailhead booths, we had almost a thousand contacts. And whenever in Nelson, we also include information on rats. Door-to-door -door education was focused on areas uh, that had heightened wildlife ac activity. So if there's bears being very active in the area, I will get that information from the conservation officers or them from following, following social media or people will contact me. And I will go there and let people know that there's wildlife active in the area and that they should do extra to manage their attractants. We talked to over 250 residents directly and left almost, like, we left over 900 uh, door hangers. Rosemont was a big area. Um, around the campground is generally a big area. Um, those weren't too biggest, but we also Fairview and Uphill. So kind of the general su suspects, but Rosemont was a really big year as usual. Garbage tagging doesn't have as much of a focus as I have in other areas like Creston. I do quite a lot of garbage tagging. Most people are not putting out their garbage the night before in Nelson. We tagged over three nights. We only tagged 23 bins. So we did each area three times. Um, there's fewer offenders than previous years. And we do have the support of bylaws now for repeat offenders. So anybody who's leaving out their garbage more than one night, we will pass that information on to bylaws as well as when we're doing door-to-door, -door, we'll pass on that information so that we'll first talk to them, of course, and try and, you know, ed provide education. Education not working, bylaws can step in. 
It was a great idea day here for uh, print, radio, and online. We had a lot of social media growth. With I think we went from about 550 followers to over 1,000. And we did that primarily through trail cam footage, so people really loved those posts, and also by engaging on community posts. So really getting involved in the neighborhood pages. Um, also did five articles in the Nelson Star covering everything from ticks to photography, ethics, Obviously, safety was on that list. And we did, um, I think it was 15 different spots on Bounce, Easy Rock, and Kootenai Co-op Radio. So it was a good year for media. Wild Safe Rangers, we did a big push. We hit most of the schools, so we hit nine schools, um, and almost 1,200 children taught. So everywhere I go right now, I have kids talking to me about bears, which is absolutely wonderful. So for those of you who don't know, the Wild Safe Ranger program is a school program from elementary to middle school. And I was really pushing to talk to higher grades this year and doing a lot of stuff with high school students outside. We did, um, we did what do you call it? We did field trips. So we went up to Apex. We went uh, to the rail trail, took kids on safety walks and really got them engaged through you know, being outside. And it was also great you know, to do during COVID. So um, we provide them with supplementary educational materials and it had several schools that got involved in bigger projects and more long-term um, kind of educational activities. So seeing them more than once and getting them involved in their whole schools, kind of providing, looking around and seeing what they can do to minimize conflict. So um, we also just generally have our online um, resources that we provide as part of BioSafe. So posters on community boards, parks, trails, and campsites that, that I generally put up year to year. We have the Wild Safe BC website, which is um, always available, that has tons of information on how to manage conflict. The shows and signage are provided to residents and to local businesses. Signage, particularly the barren area ones, are there to you know, cover for me when I can't go to every house. So, and then we have the Wildlife Alert Reporting Program, which shows on a map uh, and is updated daily, shows conservation officers, calls to the conservation officer service so people can see what's happening in their neighborhood. Obviously, not everybody calls in their wildlife conflict. So, um, but you get an idea anyway. So some continued challenge, challenges, balancing local food with wildlife conflict concerns. So people are interested in having backyard chickens and things like that. But then that brings up concerns about, you know, having, um, having bears in the area, which they love chicken feed. There were um, some people interested in that this year. The only way that um, Wild Safe BC really recommends having the, that kind of activity in a town is if there's electric fencing, which Nelson actually has a bylaw against that at this point. So... Um, that may continue to be a concern because local food is really important to the people of Nelson, but so is the wildlife, so balancing that. Urban garbage, even though people are not leaving out their garbage, um, you know, putting it out the night before, there's still people leaving out their garbage beside their houses, so really working on that. And the best thing really are is uh, that we can provide to people, or people can get, is their resistant garbage cans. And I know that that program has been having a bit of issues this year. So, and people are really keen for those garbage cans. So finding some solution to that is probably going to be something that's necessary in the future. Fruit tree management is always an issue in Nelson, getting people to pick their fruit. People still think it's just really cute to see the bears in their trees and don't understand what a problem can be. So the interface neighborhoods are always issues, particularly Rosemont and it, just anywhere that's along the forest electric fencing acceptance so that's more in the surrounding areas is because as i said it's not uh there's a bylaw against it in town but just in general for the whole area having more people more electric fences for you know maybe fruit trees for any kind of livestock uh, problem properties there are some areas in nelson where there are problem properties so working with bylaws to directly target those properties and bear resistant bins for private residences and in community spaces. There was an issue with the bears getting into uh, garbage, into uh, 
Lakeside Park this year, and we were we're in communication with the city and are aware that there's uh, been more frequent pickup and uh, there's a push to put more bear resistant bins. That's wonderful. With the suspension of the bear resistant bin program at cost for residents, there's been a lot of concern about residents and I know it's, it can be a lot to juggle, but it is something to still keep in your minds as people really desire it. And bear resistant bins are an important part of the solution for um, human and wildlife conflict. School and commercial bins were a bit of a concern this year. So just keeping an eye on those because there's been some problems with work, sa with work safe issues of lifting heavy lids that keep the bears out. But then if those lids, um, those lids can be heavy for um, workers. So finding solutions for that and working with uh, the garbage companies to find those solutions. Looking ahead, continuing with the bin spray acceptance and wildlife safety awareness. People view the wild, the, um, the trails as their backyard and they're not necessarily ready when they're going out there. So just getting people, you know, carrying their bear spray, being aware that, you know, they are going into the wilderness when they're just going up to Pulpit Rock. Continue to expand upon our collaborative local events, um, particularly with the user groups, the Trail and Wilderness Society Societies. Uh, one of the new programs that we've put is this built business pledge program. Didn't get too much done on this year. Next year, we're planning to um, basically go towards more, go to new businesses, probably get them on board, uh, keeping their business wild safe. So particularly restaurants and things like that, but also the outdoor shops because they help to spread information on to users. We started working with the local campground a little bit on the bear camping program, but they were a little bit busy with COVID and I think there was some new management, so we'll be talking to them again next year. Always increasing Indigenous awareness and collaboration with the program. So that's as COVID hopefully is waning, that's going to become an increasing um, part of our program, specifically with the educational component and working with children. We will continue to support and celebrate public initiatives with regards to bears and bins for public residents, commercial and municipal properties. Always stoked to see that. And building on electrical fencing with workshops and promotion of completed projects. We would love to thank all the people who provide funding. So obviously the province of British Columbia, the RDCK, Columbia Basin Trust, British Columbia Conservation Foundation for who I work, and the City of Nelson. Thank you very much for your continued funding, and I hope to continue the good work. Thank you, Rob. Any questions? And I don't know how. There we go. We ha okay, we have one. Uh, uh, Councilor I am back. <laughs> Councilor Woodward has a question for you. Rosie, can you Hi. Hear me? Hi, Rosie, can you hear me? I can hear you. Great. Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I was just wondering, uh, do you think that, I mean, Nelson is growing as a town. We've ticked over 11,000 people now uh, in our city. Uh, do you think, or do you see evidence that this growth is having negative impact on wildlife or more interaction with wildlife? Or does wildlife kind of move and flux with that growth and find that, do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, I understand exactly what you're saying. What I find is particularly, there is a lot of interaction that I have with new residents. Um, new, people who are coming here and are not from urban areas aren't necessarily used to living with bears in their backyards. A lot of times the initial reaction can be very dramatic when wildlife is coming around. So there's a lot of teaching them how to just live with these animals by not leaving out attractants. There may be the kind of attitude of that bad bear, that pesky bear. Just kind of turning that and reframing it to the bear is going to do what it's going to do and reframing it so that those new residents understand that it is their job to manage their attractions. So I wouldn't necessarily say it's about numbers. I would say it's about the behaviors that come with people being inexperienced in our area. So a lot of my interactions can happen with those new residents. Can I do a supplemental? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, just a supplemental, Rosie. Um, is there uh, an expedient way to um, 
I don't know if it's through the real estate board or know that when new newcomers are coming, so they get information right away. Oh, I absolutely love that because there isn't there the welcome baskets that sometimes yes. go out to new people who, yeah, so we could definitely make that happen to have materials go out in that welcome basket. I love that whole idea. It should have been done before. That's great. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Rosie. Sure you take the apples out of the welcome basket. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the uh, presentation, Rosie. Um, can you give us a, uh, a quick update on the rat problem in Nelson? Is it be better, worse, the same? I would say that it's about the same. Uh, it's, it's everywhere. Like, they're everywhere. For a while, we were mapping, you know, where they were happening, but that just became kind of a... It wasn't a useful thing anymore because they were just everywhere in Nelson. So really getting people to manage their compost is a really big one. The compost was a big deal for bears this year, but it's always a big deal for rats. So that I would actually really like to focus on compost a lot more next year because a lot of times it's just left out in barrels. I saw people with just like piles of it and it's they're, it's breeding ground. It's nesting ground for the rats. Nobody wants the rats, but they also want their compost. So working on some materials would be, I think, a good focus. Thank you. <clears throat> hey, Rosie. Um, I understand, Hi. I understand uh, Wild Safe in the past has helped the city coordinate the bear-proof bin purchases. And I'm wondering yes. uh, what work you guys are doing in other communities, how we might... Uh, resource that here in the city of Nelson to make sure that a program is available for bear proof bins. Um, can you speak to any of the other communities and how you might be able to help us make sure people can get access to those? Well, the program in Nelson is actually quite unique. Like a lot of the times when people have pick up, they like in Castlegar, they have the bear resistant bins like a, like directly associated with. Um, you know, with the trucks, which is a huge cost, right? So the program that was in Nelson that hopefully gets reinstated was quite, you know, a really nice happy medium where the bins are afford affordable to people and they're all loaner bins available to people um, through our program. I think that at least at the bare minimum going back to that would be great. I do understand the expediency of having... Um, bins put into the parks that are bear resistant and I think like I I was cut, that was my impression that that was, that was given the focus and the funding correct me if I'm wrong I really hope that you guys keep in the front of your mind that these bins are important to residents people were were kind of at a loss of where to get bins once the city ran out and there was no more so as far as other communities, it's usually integrated into the garbage pickup or there isn't something like this, right? So we're at, it's usually like this, where there's, you've got to go to the like home hardware or whatnot to buy a bin. And usually those bins are too expensive for many, many, many people. You know, even the at cost $200 bin is too expensive for many people. Um, but at least that is something. So it's usually, oh, the other one is community bins. The trail has community bins, so they'll have bins set up in areas. So um, say you have Rosemont and you don't have everybody have, you know, not everybody has those bear resistant bins, but you know it's a hot spot, then you'll have a community bin. But that brings its own issues of, you know, what are people dumping in there? Are people misusing it? So some communities don't like it. I understand it's been quite successful in trail. Does that answer your question? Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, thank it you, helps. We're, we're over 10 minutes over your time already. So Good. thank you very oh, much sorry. for a great presentation. And uh, we have two Bye. others ahead coming up next. So we got to give them an opportunity as well. My apologies. Yeah, have a great night. No problem. It's all good. Thank you very much. Thank Take you, care. Rosie. Thanks, Rosie. Bye. Thanks, Rosie. All right. Next up is the BC Council of Forest Industry. Okay, uh, Sarah's letting me know we should move receipt to the presentation move from YSA. Councillor Morrison, Councillor Page, all in favor?
carried. Um, do you want to give that email address out, Sarah, if that young lady wants to write to you? Um, uh, I will go grab a card and. Um, uh, you don't have to do it right now. You can, you can read it out if you wish. Oh, okay. Um, I think she just left. But I, I can give it to Brian. I can, I can well, it. We want to start the presentation yeah, here. So people pass let's just around. do the presentation. Okay, Thank let's you. get um, going. Great. Well, um, your worship councils, good evening. Uh, my name is Alexa Young. I'm Vice President of Government and Public Affairs at the BC Council of Forest Industries. Very happy uh, to be joining you today from the traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Stable Chief First Nations. Uh, it's not going to be news uh, to any of you that there's an important conversation happening about forestry across BC right now, and we really appreciate the opportunity to talk about some of the issues and opportunities facing the, the sector. And we really want to talk about what's on your mind and your community's mind. We also want to talk about how we can partner with communities to achieve a positive path forward for a strong, sustainable sector that continues to deliver uh, uh, social and economic benefits to British Columbians. Before I get started, um, I want to introduce my fellow colleagues, Michael Armstrong, VP Forestry at Kofi, Adam McPhee, who's joined us in the past year as Manager of Public Affairs. For those of you who don't know Kofi, we represent the majority uh, of forest product manufacturers from across BC. Also with me today are our friends and members uh, from Interfor. You will see them on the screen there, who have obviously deep ties to the Nelson region. Stuart Card, Robin Modesto, uh, and Ryan Balt. So I'm going to jump into the presentation, and what we're really looking forward to is, is your questions uh, and the dialogue uh, as, we, as we get through this here. So give me a second, and I will pull this up and take this and hope that everyone can see this. Okay. Let me know if you can't. Um, all right. Um, so, you know, the forest sector continues to be foundational to our economy. It's putting paychecks in people's pockets and helping governments at all levels pay for hospitals, schools, roads, and other critical services that we all count on. And that's about $4 billion generated to municipal governments provincially and federally annually. Um, but most importantly, it's the 100,000 people that work in and around the sector that make it great. There are foresters in Prince George, equipment repair shop owners in Nelson, biologists in Port McNeil, and drone makers in Vancouver. This includes a new region where close to 5,000 people are in forestry-related jobs. That's $460 million in annual wages that are generated. Lots of the indirect economic activities generated because the goods and services sold to forest sector companies are by local businesses. That's $7 billion spent on close to 100,000 local companies each year across the province by the forest sector, 17 million of which was in Nelson. So 70 Nelson-based businesses sold their goods and services to the forest sector. That's businesses big and small, producing everything from machine parts, high-tech tools, providing environmental consulting, uh, obviously transportation, repair, and other services. So if you just think about that, if every one of those businesses employs 5, 10, 50 employees, that's a lot of people keeping the local economy humming, restaurants open and corner stores uh, bustling. Importantly, Indigenous communities are obviously a vital part of BC's forest industry. They're tenure holders, stewardship and business partners, and employees. There's 5,300 Indigenous peoples currently employed in all parts of the sector. And as we all know, many nations really want to increase their participation in, again, all aspects of the sectors, and all members at COVID are committed to doing their part to support these aspirations and continue to, to, to um, advance reconciliation. Our members also want to keep investing to keep benefits flowing to all British Columbians. Interfor, and they can speak to this uh, in the discussion period later, recently invested $35 million at the Castle Mill in the area, um, which obviously helps create uh, a ripples across the local economy. But it's not just about contributing to the economy for economy's sake, and that's really important, because whether it's lumber, pulp and paper, mass timber, fiber-based food packaging, or PPE, forest workers are producing products that the world wants and needs. 
just think this, this work and task where I'm sitting right now or the, the mass timber building down the street, they're all storing carbon for their lifetime. The fiber-based packaging that you're seeing coming out of restaurants and grocery stores, that's going to help us reduce our use of single-use plastics and keep those out of uh, keep them out of landfills and that's going to help everyone drive to net zero and zero waste and i know a lot of communities across bc are looking to do that right now these products are also shipped to customers around the world looking to use products that are a better choice for the planet when you look at our key markets across the board it's places like the us south korea uh, china and japan of course as we continue to deal with the um, the gift that keeps on giving, the softer lumber dispute. We, we've made great inroads to diversify into Asian markets, and that's been a really positive thing for BC. And importantly, these are products that are coming from sustainably managed forests, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this. You know, 98% of forests in BC are independently certified to the highest global forest management and sustainability standards. We've got world-leading silviculture practices with three trees planted for every tree harvested. Hundreds of thousands of trees are planted annually in the province. And importantly, this all happens within a robust, world-class regulatory framework. BC's chief forester tells companies how much they can har harvest each year. The result is sustainable harvest levels, making sure forests will continue to support all the things we care about well into the future. And I think we can all agree on that's healthy environment, thriving biodiversity, good jobs, and strong communities. And continued world leadership in conservation, currently over 52% of BC's lands uh, protected or conserved, and that's something that we should be proud of as British Columbians. I know that I am, and I know that our members are. So all that to say, this is globally leading stuff, but it doesn't mean we're perfect and it doesn't mean we rest on our laurels. BC forest workers, companies, producers are always looking to do things better, safer, and more sustainably. We need to continue to strengthen our practices and our policy regimes. And the support of citizens for forestry activities is a critical component to that. That's why each year we have a third party firm, Advocates Data, go out and ask British Columbians what they think so that we can listen and learn. And the good news is, and you might not think this when you're watching the nightly news or checking your social media feed, but there is significant support for the sector among British Columbians, and I'm going to dig into that a little bit. What we found is that the majority, the vast majority of British Columbians continue to view forestry as vital to jobs and to the economy, but it doesn't stop there. Because as I just mentioned, you know, we are leaders in terms of our sustainable practices, and we've found that the vast majority, again, see BC as being a world leader in sustainable and responsible forest practices. Increasingly, we also found that most British Columbians view building with sustainable, low-carbon BC forest products as a great tool in the fight to fight climate change. And that's certainly an opportunity for BC to continue to lead the world. But like everything, there's no doubt there are many challenges to fully seizing this opportunity. We've got geopolitical tensions rising, growing, growing protectionism, and obviously significant supply chain issues. We were very pleased as a forest industry to have the CP rail dispute uh, resolved earlier today. And of course, as I talked earlier, the decades-long softwood lumber dispute with the U.S., Meanwhile, predictable access to fiber at a reasonable cost continues to be one of the primary obstacles for anyone in the forest sector. That is big companies, small companies, and indigenous-owned enterprise looking to increase their participation in the sector. And that's making it hard for everyone across the board to invest and plan for the future. And that's for a whole bunch of different reasons. It's the pine beetle epidemic. It's the impact of climate change on forests. It's a change in the regulatory landscape. We all want strong and robust regulation. That's critical and it needs to protect the environment. But we also want to make sure they're clear that they're efficient and that they avoid duplication. And this is super important because BC has got to compete with other jurisdictions as the forest products producer of choice. And we should be looking to be that responsible producer of goods uh, that the world is looking for. But I hate, as, as I think we all do, to, to focus on the challenges, because I really do think that in BC we have this incredible opportunity to work together to overcome them, because the future is bright for the future generation of forest workers. 
we can work together and that's communities, that's the labor unions, it's indigenous nations, it's government of all levels to double down on climate smart forestry, better managing our forests to deal with the impacts of climate change and make communities more resilient. We can work together to increase indigenous participation in all aspects of the sec sector, strengthen shared decision making and ensure more benefits flow to communities. We can collaborate and invest in new tools and tech to do things better and create more low carbon products across the value chain that the public, customers, and increasingly investors want and that the planet needs. And ultimately, we can partner to make life better uh, for people and communities. So we can only do that if we commit to a fact-based, balanced dialogue that has everyone at the table talking about the policies, the pathways, and the partnerships that are going to help us achieve the things we all care about. I mentioned them a while ago, but they remain the same. It's healthy forests, tools in the fight against climate change, reconciliation with Indigenous peoples, good jobs, and strong communities. Thank you, and really looking forward to the discussion, and um, would welcome any questions that you have. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hope that my fellow colleagues and friends will, will jump in and, and engage in the conversation as well. Thank you, Alex. Thank you very much. Um, we have two questions for you. So we may have more than two, but we have two two speakers so far. So Councillor Page and then Councillor Lochtenberg. Thanks, Mayor. Um, Alexa, thank you for the presentation and bringing the industry's voice uh, to the council table tonight uh, in terms of forestry. One of the questions I kind of have uh, when we look at the pressures that come in from the natural world, from climate change, you've touched on a number of them is kind of understanding the overall forest cover of the province and if we're trending in the right direction on top of uh, the industrial pressures that come from, from all the players we see around the table tonight. So can you speak a little bit to whether BC's mat forest management process is leading to a more uh, robust forest and more land being renewed and covered again, or are we trending in the other direction? Well, since I have multiple chief foresters uh, on and, and forest professionals on the line, I'm going to turn it to one of them, and I'll maybe Stuart, do you want to jump in? Yeah, certainly. I think, like uh, Alexa talked about, I mean, we are we are uh, very proud of our sustainable forest management in BC, and uh, we're very active in managing for. Uh, climate change and trying to predict the impacts, you know, from the species we plant and the stock that we plant. And we're also very active in uh, salvaging wildfire and reforesting those sites to ensure they can get back into a productive land base and can contribute to the different values that they have, um, you know, wildlife, uh, water, uh, terrain stability, etc. cetera. Um, so in my view, I think we are in good shape. There's a lot of uh, uncertainty around climate change and where things are going. Um, but we, we do have uh, some smart people that are, are on it and um, are helping us manage the forest the best that we can, including, you know, forest health, etc. So, um, yeah, I think we are in, in relatively good shape. And, you know, BC is a, is a leader in forest management, both the regulatory environment and uh, the policies that we have and uh, the foresters that manage the land base. So uh, I think it's in good hands. Um, I, I'll jump in and add just one more thing. Um, looking ahead, you know, we need to continue continuously strengthen um, stre strengthen our practices, and the forest policy modernization is is underway. And, and innovation and new tech and technology can play a major role in this as well, in terms of better understanding what's happening on the landscape, so that we can all collectively um, make better choices when it comes to being uh, in the forest and also better engage with nations and communities. And so when we when we look ahead at what is the next, you know, one of the next big things, it's gonna be things like using digital technology, big data, LIDAR, to, to get a better sense of the forest inventory and, and what's happening and, and how the forest is changing due to climate change. Thank you, Councillor Lockerberg. Thank you, uh, thank you, Alexa, for that presentation. <clears throat> I have a question about um, one of your last slides regarding the climate, the smart climate planning that you're doing in your in your in your future planning for the BC forest industry. I'd like to lay out a few stats for you and then have you comment on on what the 
what Kofi's position is on them and maybe what the BC forestry industry's position is in general. So the first is, um, as you know, the BC government puts out a regular GHG inventory that gives us a profile of what our, our relative GHG impact is. And it's about 68 megatons a year. That's about how much the province, you know, the provincial government says that we as a province produce. <clears throat> However, underneath that and unaccounted for in our total number is the GHG impact from the forestry industry. And I'll just pull out one line. So remember, 68 megatons is the top line. So decomposition of, from harvested wood products is 48 megatons. That's in 2019. So total in BC is 68 megatons. Decomposition from harvested wood products, 48 megatons. Now on top of that, there's a second thing. The BC's forests, there's a um, forest growth minus decay number on, on emissions that's been tracked over time. So it's the sort of a measure of the health of the forest, but also in terms of what is the GHG impact of the forestry industry in terms of the health of the forest. So in 1990, our forests were sequestering about 89 megatons, which more than accounted for our total production. So overall, our forests were absorbing more carbon than we as a province were producing. Today, our forests are not sequestering any carbon at all. We're actually, they're actually producing carbon. So they're so decayed, they're in such a state of decay that almost 90 megatons of sequestration have been lost from our, from our forests. So on those two lines, decomposition from your, the comp decomposition from your products, 48 megatons, and the loss of 89 megatons of sequestration, how is the, how is the, the industry going to tackle that monumental challenge going forward? Um, I'll give an opportunity to see if anyone else wants to take this one. Um, I, well, so I, I can't speak to the, you know, I was quickly trying to do the, the math here uh, on my, in my notes. Um, but I think there's, I, you know, if I understand your question correctly, I think there's multiple, um, you know, there's, there's multiple things that um, kind of work within that. One which is climate smart forestry. It's how do we continuously strengthen what we're doing in the forest to actually um, make sure we're not um, leaving, uh, you know, leaving uh, stuff in the forest that, that is susceptible uh, to, to, to fires, and, and that's super important. And that's, that's going to be a collective effort and, and something that, um, that all parties are going to have to be involved in. Um, I think the second, the second thing that, that needs to be considered is the role that forest products play. There's, there's um, academics and experts out there who have done good work at looking at the power of essentially substitution. When you're building with wood, using wood products instead of, let's say, cement or steel, um, you're displacing a, a huge amount of, of carbon intensive uh, of building materials. And so that needs to, to be built into the equation. Um, and, and that's why you have to look at it from a, a, a much more macro uh, perspective. I think in terms of the, um, the forest, the harvest revenue, I mean, I think there's great work, and maybe Michael can speak to this a little bit, pilots being undertaken to look at what are, what are different um, methods um, to, to, to essentially increase our ability to take out uh, wood residue out of, out of the forest. Michael, did you want to speak to that a little bit? Sure. Yeah, I guess, I, I mean, I haven't seen those numbers before, but just thinking on initial blush. So, you know, in, in 1990, um, you know, the, the annual level cut would have been a lot higher than it is now, um, and it's been great, greatly reduced. And also, um, you know, if you're talking about climate smart forestry, you know, our equipment and our, our way to, to harvest would be um, greatly reduced in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. So I wonder if it's related to sort of more wildfires um, and more uh, pest uh, infestation. But I'd have to sort of look at that. Sorry, I don't want to throw you off there, but I'll just clarify. Yeah. We're just talking about the waste from the decomposition from from waste, so that would be the slash piles, that would be the the, the materials at the mill, 
that's just decomposing on site. That's that's all. And 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 I just want to also preface, say something that I'm. I live in a wood house. I'm a fan of the the forest industry when it's done sustainably, and and I think we've got some really great companies here in the Kootenays. So, not not trying to put you on the spot here, but I think this is a practical thing for you guys to to challenge yourself on dealing with the waste that's decomposing and 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 creating a lot of emissions, and then both both at the mill as well as on site. So so some of the the methods you're using in terms of the these big slash piles that are that are left standing, the, the waste in the ground. Those are the things you could probably speak to, and without, you know, with within within your own planning that you've been doing so far. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah. I mean, there is definitely, um, you know, industry and government have been working for a few years on ways to uh, utilize all the all the fiber from the the, uh, the bush. Uh, there's something called Forestman Ant Society of uh, BC, which uh, we support, which um, helps companies. Uh, some of our members partake in that, and that helps extract that uh, that fiber, or that uh, I guess the waste wood, um, to be utilized. Um, so we are w working with government, and that uh, in the latest budget they got uh, funding again for the next few years for that. So that's great. One of the issues again is sort of yeah the economics uh, of that. And so we're working with government and trying to find other opportunities for that fiber. Um, you know, we got rid of beehive burners and uh, slash pile burning uh, years ago. So we're, you know, now into pellets um, and uh, pulp mills are utilizing that fiber. So we're definitely looking at it. We're aware of it. Uh, I think Robin and I deal with it almost uh, weekly or monthly with government. So uh, we're pursuing that for sure. Just, just as a practical um, here. I would say that uh, you know, I, Ryan Waltz, uh, who runs manager and police here for him for anything mill is used, so anything that comes to the mill, so the saw logs, obviously the uh, the um, the sawdust get you know gets utilized, the uh, the hog gets utilized for electricity, uh, obviously sold to the pulp mill. In the bush, I mean, one of our strongest allies is the pulp mill. If uh, if it's economical to ship the uh, the slash piles to the pulp mill that uh, that uses up the majority of the slash piles. Um, but that's but that's not possible but a challenge for those slash piles. And there is obviously to leaving, you know, coarse weed root on the block to break down to uh, mix with the soil and be kind of the, the fertilizer for the next next plantation or next generation that comes in. So as foresters we'd love to use that uh, fiber in the bush and we, we use all of it that comes into the mill. Thank you, Ryan. If I could just add. This is, this is not a question. I just will point to you, you. Those numbers that I got come from, from the BC government. So if you did a search for BC government inventory, it's right on their website, GHG inventory. You, you'd find it. And it's a, it's a big question. And, um, you know, and I, I think I'll, I'll just uh, kind of wrap up to say, the, you know, the, the, the comment and, you know, and I think there's a lot of, um, people focused on this and, and looking at creative ways to, to continuously strengthen how how the industry um, deals with with this issue and um, yeah I look forward to continuing to keep you updated on on progress from that perspective. Thanks, Councillor Woodward. You had a question. Yes. We're getting a little tight for time, uh, Alexa, okay. and so I have one more question here from Councillor Woodward. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so again. I as Council Ottenberg said, I live in a wood house. I use paper products. We all do. Uh, it's vital in our lives, and I get that. Uh, my concern is uh, 2017, 2018, and 2021 were the one, two, and three, I think it was the correct, one, two, and three worst wildfire seasons in BC's history. And 2021 was, from beginning to end, a climate catastrophe in this province. Um, we can all attest to that. We lived through it. Um, so my, my question to you is this idea that we need to move towards sustainability, and especially with the forest harvesting sustainably. And I'm wondering about the, the sort of battle between growth, perpetual growth in an industry such as forestry, and this need and the dire need for sustainability and to rewild our landscapes so that we can store carbon. So I'm wondering, how do we balance a healthy forest industry without having 
year-over-year growth? I can take that one. I, I think in BC, it's probably a misconception that we're, we have year-over-year -year growth, as Michael alluded to. Our, our harvest levels have dropped significantly since the 90s to where the point where almost half of where they were um, you know, 20, 30 years ago. So um, that, to me, is, is a very conscious um, and sustainable outcome where um, the harvest levels are constantly evaluated and reviewed and uh, are set at sustainable levels into the long term. And I think it's important, climate change is real, it's in front of us, but it's also important to note that the IPCC themselves have noted that sustainable forest management um, aimed at providing timber, fiber, biomass, non-timber resources, and other ecosystem functions and services can lower GHG emissions and contribute to the climate adaptation as well. And it's really a key part of that. You know, Alexa talked about substitution products. Um, so forest management, active forest management, it's going to uh, assist with the fight against climate change. It's going to help us um, minimize and mitigate against catastrophic fire years. Um, we need to be more active on the front. There's no question about it, and there's more that can be done. But leaving the stands as they are to go about naturally is not always the solution, and a lot of times we have to be in there actively managing it to protect our communities and our forest resources and the other resources that we garner from those areas. So that's a, that's a great point, and I know we're, we're out of time, but I just want to add an anecdote, because I think it's really important. Um, over, over the pandemic, when people were at home, um, you know, looking for something to do, so they were looking to build a deck or repair their house or even buy a house, um, there was, you know, we had for a lot of other reasons, including demand, um, some supply shortages, and, and people, consumers, citizens were asking the question, you know, why, why can't we get more online? And Stuart's point is the point that we, under a strict, robust regulatory regime with a, a chief officer, is setting the annual allowable cut to make sure it's sustainable for today, tomorrow, and the future. And so we do not actually want them to flip the switch. And, you know, um, they've already done, d done, the, done the equation to balance all of the values of what the fourth represent, and we respect that. Um, and so we can't just turn on the tap, and, and that's a good thing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Alexa. Thank you. I know from experience this conversation could easily go on for half a day. And maybe in the future that's something that probably should happen with local governments. Um, thanks very much for taking the time to be with us tonight. And I look forward to seeing you potentially at the Kofi Convention in Vancouver. Absolutely. We're looking forward to it. All right. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Okay, up next, Kootenai Climbing Association. Woo! Is the presentation coming from Cam or is it coming from here? From here. From here, please. Okay, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so is, uh, are you turning the wheels or is Cam? Well, I'm gonna try and get it, pull it up here. Okay. Amy and Brian will present, and I'm here for backup. Okay. So you can use the arrows to. I think. Oh, the tech. Always a struggle. Screen? Yeah, Go sorry, view, I'm just looking screen. for the way to make it full screen. Okay. Under view. Under view? Just take your time, Sarah. That's all good. Thank you.
All right, are we ready? And your name is? Oh, sorry, let me just close this little. Is there a way to get that box to close? I can't get it. Oh, I have to do it. There we go. Good work. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Mayor Dooley, counselors and staff, I'm Jamie Moy speaking on behalf of the Kootenay Climbing Association. Thank you for having us. We're happy to be presenting tonight. I'm going to speak briefly about who we are, our CUBE Climbing Center, our vision for the CUBE 2.0. We'll run through budget and financing as it's anticipated to be, and we'll end with our specific ask of the city. We are climbers, yes, but we are, well, that's just the start. We're engineers, we're scientists, we're architects, we're parents, we're small business owners. We're internationally accredited mountain guides and we are award-winning writers. Together we form the Kootenay Climbing Association, founded as a nonprofit in 2012. We are directly responsible for envisioning and implementing the current climbing center in Nelson, the Cube, which opened its doors in 2014. As a fully volunteer board of directors, we're particularly thankful that at this moment in time, we feel we have the exact right mix of people of skills and of motivation to make an expansion project happen. And we want to capitalize on that. Before I get into our vision, I want to speak a bit about the existing cube. We are located on the Selkirk College campus inside of Mary Hall. We ran through our numbers to give you a quick view of our current cube climbers. And for those people who identify with the gender, 55% are men, 45% are women. This is where our climbers come from, not surprisingly, it's a small local climbing gym that's mostly Nelson and the surrounding area, at least for now. The Cube has experienced year-over-year -year growth in both revenue and numbers of climbers, except for a small dip during the pandemic when we had to close down for a while. It's worth noting that we are not open during the summer, and that's because we're located inside Mary Hall, so we are tied to the campus's operations. We have projected figures plugged in there for our current operating year, um, which is looking to be our best year yet. We're going to top 10,000 climber check-ins for the first time, and we will exceed $160,000 in revenue, which is quite amazing for a small climbing gym that's not even open in the summer. The Cube's overall revenue, revenue growth is 84%. But our biggest growth is among youth. We opened our first after-school youth climbing program in 2017, and since then we've experienced 203% growth. Which brings us to our current problem. We've outgrown our current facility. We're just 111 square meters. All of our youth programs now fill with a wait list. This season alone, we're going to see 270 kids and teens come through our after-school climbing programs, and yet we're having to turn some away simply because we can't accommodate everyone who wants to climb with our existing facility. We should also mention we're servicing only a fraction of the indoor climbing community, just the type that's known as bouldering. We're basically too short with our wall size to be able to accommodate sport climbers and to have speed climbing, the third discipline of indoor climbing, we would need both taller walls and a lot more width. So basically we need to be taller and we need to be a lot wider. The growth that we're experiencing, it's pretty much the norm. It's being felt all across North America. Climbing's recent inclusion in the, as an Olympic sport is part of it, yes, but the explosion in the popularity of indoor climbing has been happening for a while now. Since the Cube opened its doors in 2014, indoor climbing in North America has become a $700 million industry. It was predicted to top a billion by 2021. It's not a fad. Looking to Europe, we're seeing it as a lifestyle. In France, for example, Indoor climbing is like hockey is to Canada. So in every small town, no matter how small the town, there's a climbing gym. A big part of this upward trajectory is indoor climbing is simply more accessible and we call it more inclusive than outdoor climbing. So it's a smaller time investment to start, a smaller investment in gear and equipment, and it's got a less steep learning curve. So basically kids, brand new climbers, and people in urban areas with indoor climbing can safely experience the fun and fitness of climbing. 
Another challenge we've had with our current gym is we can't host sanctioned climbing competitions. We went ahead and ran some preliminary figures to determine the potential revenue to the city of Nelson a climbing competition would bring. So say it was a moderate regional climbing competition with about 100 out of town competitors and say each of those people brought maybe a parent or a partner with them. Over the course of a you know weekend climbing competition maybe held twice a year, we're looking at $150,000 between fuel accommodations and food. If you ratchet that up to a major climbing competition, something like a World Cup Youth Championship, we're projecting a minimum of half a million dollars in just a single climbing competition. This, of course, cascades over into outdoor rock climbing, which we are becoming a major hub for here in the West Kootenay. In case you didn't know, we've got more than 2,500 named climbing routes. Having a world-class indoor training facility here where we're hosting climbing competitions and events, that just further increases our visibility and furthers the growth of outdoor recreation and climbing in Nelson and in the surrounding area. So talking about our vision for a Cube 2.0, we formed an expansion committee in 2019 to start piecing together that vision. That year and the following, we did several presentations and meetings to solicit input uh, we met with the Recreation Commission, for example, also the city. So what we're presenting today is a culmination of those efforts, as well as the results of a site location analysis. Here's some of what we could offer with the new climbing gym. Our vision is a facility that has all three disciplines of rock climbing, so the bouldering that we currently service, the sport and the speed, a place for fun and fitness, but also an Olympic caliber training facility and a tourist draw. We'd also like to eventually roll out a climbing academy like they do at the Boulders Climbing Gym in Saanich, where climbing courses get integrated into school curriculums. In 2021, we hired Studio 9 Architecture and Planning to do a comprehensive analysis to determine the most feasible location for a new climbing gym in Nelson. That 20-page report was included in your material hopefully, for this presentation, so I'm not going to go through that. But I will mention our preferred site for the Keep 2.0 is at 10th Street, um, 820 10th Street. It was one of the top two contenders in Studio 9's analysis, and some of the pluses are listed here on this slide. Some other reasons we like it, um, we think 500 square meters for a new facility is the bare minimum. This particular plot would allow us to go bigger even much bigger if that turned out to be the right way to go. Um, and we like the proximity to LVR and also Selkirk for potential partnerships and programming. Something else we love is being located on the edge of the forest, close to a lot of other outdoor recreation. We've got mountain biking trails just above 10th Street, the rail trail, and then I want to point out this last bullet point here up on the slide, proximity to outdoor climbing. So that's super cool. Right above the rail trail is the CIC Climbing Bluffs, which is an outdoor area. Imagine one of the things we could offer in our new climbing gym is transition courses from indoor to outdoor rock. I did just want to mention an alternative site for the Cube 2.0. So this was the other top contender from that analysis. Um, this would put the facility down in the existing rec complex downtown. When it comes down to it, our team is ready to proceed with either location. We just think that the best climbing gym for us and for Nelson is one that we can implement quickly. We feel like we have the team right now to do this. We're ready to do it. And we just feel that that's more possible with 10th Street than Front Street. I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Brian Hansen. He is the Cube's general manager. He's going to run you through the numbers of budget and financing and wrap it up. Thanks, Jamie. You're welcome. All right. Thank you, Jamie. So I'm sure we've impressed upon everyone here that the level of success that we've seen at our current facility is impressive. 84% growth over seven years is substantial. And as a nonprofit, it's also important to see how we spend those revenues. Um, we've paid off all of our existing business loans from the current facility within the first two years of operations. We've contributed then twenty dollars to $40,000 annually to facility upgrades and equipment purchases. We heavily subsidize our youth programs, some of which we even operate at a financial loss to the business as a community service. 
We pay our staff a fair living wage for Nelson, BC, and we've already saved over $60,000 for this expansion project. Moving into the projected facility, our first year of revenue, we're estimating at $440,000. A big one here, not being tied to Selkirk's operational year, we're able to stay open through the summer months. So that gives us an extra three months of operation. We're also able to choose our own hours of operation. So we would be able to almost double the hours that were open, especially on weekends, which we're currently only allowed to be open for five hours a day. Um, we're no longer having to kick people out after two hours because we don't have the space and we no longer have lineups to get in, which is really important. Um, we would be able to increase our youth programming so we no longer have wait lists and we'd be able to create adult programming, which is something we've just never been able to do due to our size. Um, we'd also have that dedicated kids adventure zone, which is a space where kids can safely just be kids and we'd have childcare, which would be a really big benefit to the parents who are climbers as well. We also have that continued market growth that we've seen regionally and globally, and we'd be able to implement some strategic marketing so we could try to bring in people that haven't been climbing here, which we just haven't bothered because we don't have the space to facilitate it. Um, we're projecting our operational expenses to be approximately $422,000 in that first year. The big one here is bringing on five additional full-time employees. So at the moment, I have two full-time employees um, we'd be bringing in five additional to service this larger facility, as well as keeping our casual and part-time employees as well. Um, we'd be servicing a $1 million loan for this build. And as a larger facility, we just have increased costs in general administration and running the business. So in terms of our budget, um, we just updated this with our current numbers. Um, for the building itself, we'd be looking at $3.3 million. And then the climbing surfaces and equipment together it comes in at just a mil about a million dollars. So 4.2 million all in. In terms of financing, would be the two big ones here is that $1 million loan and then federal and provincial grants of approximately $2.5 million. So to give you guys an idea, um, the Boulders and Saanich, when they built their nonprofit climbing gym of a similar size a few years ago, they brought in $3 million in federal and provincial grants. Um, we'd be looking at bringing in Cube Savings um, community fundraising, and then um, a pretty conservative estimate of corporate sponsorship of $50,000. So all in for uh, $4.3 million in the financing. Leading up to this presentation, we created an online petition to try to get an idea of the level of support that we'd be seeing from the community, and it was excellent. Um, in two weeks, we had almost 1,500 petitions signed. Um, based on postal codes of those signatures, we had over half of those from within city limits itself, a few hundred from the surrounding area, and the rest being made up largely from the lower mainland, but all over BC, Alberta, and the states just south of us. Another great, um, a really good um, extra added benefit to that petition was being able to read all the comments that we had. There were some really powerful messages we had people telling us that they would move to Nelson if we built a facility like this. And we had people telling us that through the pandemic, our facility was one of the only things that kept them going. Um, just recently, we've started building relationships with some local businesses to start building some um, corporate sponsorship. Um, we've already signed on four and we're in the process of another six that we're just setting up the fine details with. We've also received a letter of support from Nelson and Kootenai Lake Tourism to show that they are in support of this project, both in terms of the bigger picture of what increasing climbing in our area would bring to the West Kootenai and for Nelson itself for um, competitions and what this facility could do for our town. So our official ask is to obtain a lease to develop the Cube 2.0 at the 10th Street location. What we would be looking for is um, a lease with a nominal annual fee of say a dollar while we are repaying that $1 million loan. And then after we've repaid that loan, we could change that to a reasonable rate. What I really want to stress here is that the Cube would not look for any ongoing facility maintenance nor operational support. We would be able to take care of all of that ourselves. Um, what we would also ask for though, is the city's continued support um, in terms of 
Something like what Kootenai Lake Tourism did for us with a letter of support, we'll be entering a really important granting process. We'll be hiring a grant writer to go after those large federal and provincial grants. And we'd just like the city to still be visible that they're behind us in this project. So I'd like to thank council for allowing us to talk, give this presentation and open it up to any questions or discussion. Thank you, good job. Questions? Councillor Woodward and then Councillor Jarwood. Go ahead. I went before. Go ahead. I'll go after you. Okay. Hi. Thanks for that. Um, could you speak to the $2.5 in grants you would hope to raise and what granting bodies would be likely yeah, providing sure. that money? Um, so we do have that included in the business plan that we'll be presenting. Um, do you have any of the specifics? I don't. Yeah. Cam, do you have any of the exact? Um, I don't have them on hand. We've laid them out in the business plan. But there's a number of, um, we've been talking to some lobbyists who work in this area. And um, there are some adventure tourism infrastructure grants uh, that we've heard are coming down the pipeline. Um, We'll be submitting the business plan this week, and uh, we could, you could reference them there. Another big one um, was um, its uh, community development in response to the pandemic um, recovery. Mm -hmm. So that was the one of the ones that they said for us to really pay attention to. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I was just wondering, um, maybe it was buried in this big report here. Um, I was wondering about how long do you think from breaking ground to completion and opening are we talking about? I mean, I know there are supply chain issues, so factoring that in. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Cam, do you have anything to add on? <laughs> um, there's a few factors. There's the building construction. Um, Randy, you'd probably know the best. Are you in the audience? What do you think it would take to get a building like that up? He's hiding. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, uh, once the funding's in place uh, and you know, there's, there's engineering and architecture and so on, there's, there's a point that we can probably get ahead of the game with that before we have everything in place. But the actual construction, you know, eight months, I would imagine. It's, so, it's not yeah. a complicated facility, yeah. really. It's kind of like a warehouse with... I mean, it's a lot yeah. of volume, a lot of space, yeah. right? So there's not a lot of... You know, there is a... a the, the longest phase uh, would probably be... Um, well, aside from construction, is the upfront design um, of the wall surfaces and making sure that we have all the features that we need to bring the vision to life. Um, but if... If we're in a position where we can break ground, that's that's a great position to be in. And, and that site is also about as easy as it gets in this town to build on, for sure. Mm. I actually was going to ask you if that was kind of supplemental. Yes, absolutely. Uh, just about that site. Um, when you've looked at it, um, you know, is there enough room for staging ground and all that stuff so that, that there hasn't have to be a bunch of site work before the building's done? Do you feel like that? You kind of just arrive and go. I think so, yeah, yeah. Okay. Especially for this type of building, this type of fabrication, probably it's going to be probably quite modular. So I think it will, I think it will go up fast and not need a lot of staging. Okay. Although that space has that anyway. Yeah. So it's got everything you really need for a builder for sure. Okay. Thank you. I spoke to the um, regional rep for Waltopia, which is the people who would design and put together this this climbing surface and um, they said design and build stage would be also about six months so yeah once we would be designing before we have the construction complete and then um, putting it together is actually pretty quick once it's once we have the building envelope great thank you so Morrison or Councillor Page yeah sorry I yeah yeah, yeah. so um, just going back to making sure that your numbers look correct now have you um have you, is there a contingency built into these numbers or are they going to be further fleshed out in your um business plan as you're working on it i just 
I just keep going back to the fact that how the cost of everything has escalated and I'm just listening to this timeline. So there's still some design stuff that has to go on before you start buying the two by fours, you know, hopefully locally from the Kofi group that we just, you know, saw. <laughs> um, maybe you got a sponsor there. Um, I'm just wondering in terms of the supply chain issues, how you're looking at dealing with them because I mean, the, the cost, the costs look reasonable. I mean, I've been inside a few climbing gyms. Right, in fact, I took a peek in a brand new one that they haven't even cracked the doors open in uh, Phoenix when I was there um, a month ago. Um, so it is. I understand the concept of vacant space. I mean, you just kind of need walls, and then you have then you put up your climbing surfaces. But um, are you building in a contingency? I'm just thinking that it almost costs this much to to build a house in Nelson. It seems like these days. Sorry, don't mean to minimize that, but totally. I mean it's yeah. Yeah, and to give you a perspective, so when we originally wrote the business plan in 2019, we went back and I just updated everything with 2022 costs. Okay. Um, I seen increases of at least 20% um, in building and actually um, climbing foam, I just found out is largely produced in Russia and Ukraine. <laughs> and <laughs> They've just seen an increase of 110%. Um, wow. But, you know, um, if you can get it. Yeah. Mm. So yes, yeah, we are There's seeing that in. Um, there's just one one other thing um, is that we have not really green lighted the design phase because we don't have a site. That's really the first step is to get a site and then we can start the process. Um, you know, we need to be able to fund it and, and get the granting in place. So there's a bunch of steps actually ahead of all the, um, you know, the building and the design and that kind of stuff. So, thanks. Can I have a subsequent? Am I allowed a subsequent? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know ahead. that we want to not, don't go over time. One more speaker, and then. Um. So. Uh, one more. Now I've completely forgot my question. I'll come back if I get a chance. No, you go. <laughs> okay. Thank you, guys. I'm really glad to have you guys here today to present. I've challenged you in the past with. Uh, some questions because, you know, I want to help you create the strongest poss possible project. In looking at your executive summary report that you provided to council and in the agenda package, uh, the other site that you've also have here as the alternative is that Front Street location. Uh, and the Studio 9 architects at the time noted that the high visibility, the adjacentness to tourist amenities, and the research that they had done across the spectrum indicated that tourism was a huge driver of the revenue potential of this facility. Um, the last time we had you got, last time I saw you uh, at a public table was at the Recreation Commission and we were given kind of a four to five year kind of time frame of when you really needed to be getting shovels in the ground. So the context of this question is as you guys have this all-star team now and also this idea of long-term sustainability, but this team creates a sense of urgency. How urgent realistically, if something like Front Street could be on the table, would you be able to weigh the need to get an answer now, try and grab onto some of these COVID funding versus taking that risk of waiting longer and letting the process kind of play out to see if this can be something more incorporated into the recreation campus. And I ask that too, because your report also uh, had a survey that was conducted, and when you take the, the summation of the res response, 74% of, I think I've got my numbers right, 74% of people wanted it somewhere in the recreation campus versus 25%, 26% up at 10th Street. So the question really is, does this urgency really serve the long-term large vision of climbing, and is it really a game stopper if it needs to take a bit longer to get a better location or at least get the panoptical location Cam? Right. Um, is that okay if i take that yeah of course you, know, you have the most experience on this part okay thanks so much keith for reviewing it and reading it because um <clears throat> we are quite flexible we're looking to work with the city in whatever um, where do we have to to obtain a site? Um, you know, we're we're scared of having a process 
that's not um, easy to follow or that we don't know how to navigate and that we don't we can't bound in time um, so I think our nudge was if we can do it simply we're not worried about people being able to find us if we have a world-class facility in Nelson people would find us if the city could get behind it and we could do it in the rec um, campus that would be phenomenal we're just afraid that that may take um, a, a very long time we don't know but you know that's kind of what we're here for you guys to tell us and I, do, I don't think we make any decisions at this meeting but we just want you to know we're extremely excited to work with you guys and we're flexible and even if you guys came up with a better property that isn't on our list we'll look into it but um, like Jamie said in, in the presentation the best gym is the one that we can start solving our problems with as soon as possible so we're just looking for whatever way we can work with you on that. Thanks, Cam. Thanks, Cam. Okay. So I remember my question. Yeah, go ahead. So I, I, I'm really sorry I wasn't able to go on the day that you guys all got to go, but I did hear that nobody was allowed to climb. So I'm really dis I'm, I'm happy and I'm disappointed at the same time. So mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm sure gonna... they offered. We, I, were, we, I, we, we offered. Opportunity. Nobody chose <laughs> to oh, climb. Mean, oh, there was no could... ban on climbing. We all pulled it. <laughs> We all boulder. Come anytime. Okay, well, I'm coming. Janice, I'm coming then without a, a, anytime you want to come, we will have you as a guest of honor. <laughs> a guest Thank of you. honor. Um, so what I'm reading here is that you're looking for, um, I'm, I'm sort of going to call it a donation of, of land, and that you're going to pay a doll. You would be like, like the idea of the dollar a year or whatever. And, and then once you get your debt paid, that you would be looking at a reasonable amount of money do you have any idea what the reasonable amount of money is like tax well <laughs> oh i'd increase it to double double the cost yeah are you are you looking at um at pay, paying the property tax or are you looking at paying um trying to over a period of time pay back the equivalent of what the land would have been worth um can you just give me a, a I, that, Janice, that's kind maybe of my I question help there are you familiar with council's lease policy on lease of land yeah so it's five percent assessed value okay. of, of the land so that's okay. that's what normally any other um facility would be paying that in a, in the normal course of 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 using city land that's for a non-profit if you're a profit business then it's nine percent of eight no okay. okay so that's that's the current policy of council Okay, there you Could go. We, now, you got, now you got another number to throw into the budget. Thank you. It only makes it it's good. Plan better. Only firms it up. <laughs> yeah. It, it only makes it um, better, right? That's one last question. Uh, to we so, got we have the lease game to to get to. Um, so I'll be really quick. Um, the existing facility. Uh, I discovered at the presentation that it's actually. I didn't know this. That it it could be taken apart or almost in whole, and you can do something with it. Mm. Could it? what would you do with it because it seems like it's an amazing work of art like it's beautifully done so yeah we have had interest by other um, climbing gyms so out of revelstoke for example that they've expressed an interest in purchasing that from us okay um, so that could be a source of revenue for the build itself um, if it was at the 10th street location we could also um, continue with that facility as an annex for training purposes for trades for high angle rescue for SAR. Um, we could use it for kids camps, for school groups. Um, I think there's a lot that we could do with it, whether it stays in that specific location or if we dismantle it and, and sell it to another facility. Mm. Great, thanks. Thank you very much for your presentation. I appreciate it. Uh, Cam, thank you very much for tuning in. We haven't got a clue where you are. I see I'm in, in Silver Star. <laughs> it's in the void. Like, oh, uh, Silver Star. Th thanks for everybody making the time for this again. Yeah. Really thank appreciate you. it. Thank thanks, much. Cam. Thanks. And, uh, we'll, thank you. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, uh, Jamie. Just like the last presenter, this is a presentation to council, and we'll talk about it, and we'll decide going forward from here. So thanks very Great. much. Great. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah. all right. I just need a motion now to move receipt of the last two presentations. So.
moved by Councillor Woodward, second by Councillor Page. All in favour? Thanks very much, and thanks everybody for coming. You probably get a bit of a flavour of what goes on here at night at the Committee of the Whole. So thanks for being here. Really appreciate it. All right, take care. Yes. Motion See to adjourn, two please. Weeks. Okay. Councillor Woodward, Councillor Renwick. All in favour? Carried. Thanks very much. We're going back into camera. We adjourned that meeting. We are. <laughs> In camera? No. <laughs> no. Are we going to decide about the Nick person? Next meeting. I thought that. I thought